So welcome first to Jerry, uh, and welcome to everyone else. Um, there was, as many of you know, a um, cloak of secrecy surrounding this event for a long time, maintained until quite recently. But as I think everybody knows by now, we are gathered here at the invitation of Ruth, who just spoke, and uh, Justin Hughes and Irene Calboli, um, who together have organized this event for the purpose of celebrating and honoring the academic career of Jerry Reichman, which I hasten to add is not over yet. <laughs> so Ruth, Justin, and Irene have asked me to say a few words at the threshold of this conference concerning the place of Jerry's scholarship in the overall trajectory of intellectual property teaching and writing. So with some trepidation, um, here they are. To a substantial degree, Jerry's work has set the tone for the modern study and teaching of intellectual property, both in the United States and increasingly in the rest of the world. The first and perhaps most important respect in which Jerry's work has been to many of us a beacon has been the clarity of the normative framework that infuses his scholarship. Long ago, at a time when the most prominent trend in legal scholarship aspired to reshape doctrines to maximize allocative efficiency, meaning roughly speaking, uh, aggregate consumer welfare measured by consumers' willingness and ability to pay for goods and services, Jerry charted a very different course. His goals, made explicit in every one of his books and articles, are first, distributive justice. He repeatedly asks, how can we adjust the law to ensure that all persons are treated fairly, and in particular, to reduce the disadvantages of poor people and poor nations. Second, the progress of science. Jerry is intensely aware of the impact of intellectual property laws, not just on the incentives of scientists to innovate, which is the conventional focus, but at least as much on their ability to share information and to build upon one another's work. So when he started those two commitments, distributive justice on one hand and the progress of science on the other, were unusual, and now they are much less so. The second respect in which Jerry's work was path-breaking is his global orientation. It's still the case, I think, that most teachers of most fields of law both in the United States and other countries, devote disproportionate attention to the rules in force in the countries where their universities are located. The result is that most class discussions and syllabi contain only occasional vows to rules in force in other countries, typically to suggest the contingency of the rules that are the primary focus, namely the domestic regime. By contrast, Jerry's work has always paid close attention, first, to the multilateral and regional agreements that limit the freedom of lawmakers in most countries, and then to the range of ways in which lawmakers in those countries nevertheless remain free and how they might most effectively exercise the discretion left to them. Most other teachers of intellectual property, in the United States at least, and increasingly the rest of the world have come round to this global orientation. And it is this attention constantly to the global implications of intellectual property that makes us eccentric within law schools, at least in the United States. Third, Jerry's scholarship is intensely concerned with what we in the field generally refer to as balance by which we mean adjusting legal rules so as to maximize the benefits of intellectual property while minimizing its disadvantages. That this is now a cliche is in part testimony to Jerry's influence. 
To be sure, Jerry's not been entirely alone in this respect. Some of his predecessors, I'm thinking particularly of Ben Kaplan and his unhurried view of copyright, similarly aspired to achieve this balance. But Jerry's work, particularly with respect to patent law, has helped popularize appropriately in the field this general approach. Somewhat less obvious than these three influential dimensions of Jerry's work has been his consistent commitment in his scholarship and presumably in his teaching to a methodology that I tentatively venture is traceable to American legal realism, the dominant movement in US legal scholarship from the 1920s and early 1930s. Legal realism seems to shine through Jerry's work in several ways. The first is his intense focus on remedies. A fundamental aspect of legal realism in its original form was the conviction that rights exist only to the extent that remedies are available, available to enforce them. To determine the ambit of rights, one should ask about the scope of the accompanying remedies, not vice versa. It's this orientation that explains the fact that for many of us, the first topic in our course on contracts was expectation damages, exemplified, this is gonna be an appeal to the older generation, by the hairy hand case, not offer an acceptance. The underlying assumption was that to understand contracts, you need first to know exactly how they are enforced. As American legal culture drifts slowly away from its legal realist anchor, Jerry's stance is becoming less conventional, but not among intellectual property scholars who still focus appropriately intensely on remedies. For example, the conditions under which injunctive relief is available, the merits and demerits of statutory damages, and so forth. Jerry's particular focus with respect to remedies has been on liability rules, which he has long argued have several advantages over property rules when defining the scope of rights over scientific information, data, traditional knowledge, microbial resources, and so forth. So for the benefit of the law students in the room, the differentiation of property rules and liability rules can be traced to a highly influential article by Guido Calabresi, who will be speaking to us tomorrow, and Doug Melliman. They argued convincingly long ago that some legal entitlements are backed up with so-called property rules, which enable the holders of those entitlements to refuse to surrender them, which in turn empowers them to demand freely negotiated fees in return for permitting access to the resources in question. By contrast, other legal entitlements are backed up with liability rules, which permit other parties to demand access to the relevant resources if they pay fees and comply with other conditions set by the state, by the state meaning judges or administrative agencies or occasionally by legislatures. Not surprisingly, most of the entitlements at stake in real property law are backed by property rules, while most of the entitlements generated by contract law are backed only by liability rules. Intellectual property law, despite the misleading title we now use for the field as a whole, contains a mixture of property rules and liability rules. Jerry has long argued that liability rules have important advantages, specifically in reducing transaction costs and, to return to the earlier theme, reconciling the benefits of incentives for innovation with the need for sharing information and facilitating cumulative innovation. Now that, as many of you know, puts his argument broadly and crudely. Most of Jerry's reform proposals consists of detailed, fine-grained varieties of liability rules, sometimes confined with carefully delimited property rules. So I expect we're gonna hear a good deal more about this theme in the course of the conference, and certainly in Judge Calabresi's address. Another respect in which legal realism seems to infuse Jerry's work is his strong commitment to what may be described as particularism. The realist argued that, first, when describing legal systems, 
general categories should be broken down into smaller units. For example, following Roscoe Pound, they argued that scholars should be more interested in real or, as he put it, working rules, by which they meant descriptions of how courts were actually resolving disputes than in paper or black letter rules. Adherence to that guideline, the realist contended, would likely reveal that judges were far more sensitive to the peculiarities of fact patterns than usually supposed by most scholars. The net result was that an accurate map of the landscape of the law would consist of more and more specific norms than could be found in the standard treatises. Similarly, when it came to crafting new rules, the realist argued that a lawmaker, whether a judge or a legislature, should avoid uh, broad generalizations and instead focus on the particular economic and cultural conditions of the field at issue. Jerry's work adheres to this orientation. He pays very close attention to the particular economic and cultural conditions surrounding the production and dissemination of each type of intellectual product, and then argues for deployment of the optimal set of detailed, highly specific rules tailor-made to these conditions. This is exactly what Carl Llewellyn and his colleagues recommended. Now, it should be admitted that not all intellectual property scholars share this orientation. Some continue to argue, sometimes on prudential grounds, for the maintenance of general rules of patent law, copyright law, and so forth. But I think it's fair to say that a majority share Jerry's preference toward particularism. Finally, there's one major dimension of Jerry's work that, at least thus far, remains unusual. He may eventually be regarded, as was, say, Holmes in the area of the First Amendment, as a pioneer, but not yet. Most of us are inclined to think that, in most contexts, intellectual property protection is binary. You either have a copyright or you don't. Your invention is sufficiently novel, non-obvious, and useful to warrant patent protection, or it's not, and so forth. Jerry, by contrast, sees innovations as a raid along a spectrum. At one extreme are true breakthroughs. At the opposite extreme are pedestrian applications of well-known principles. And in between is a very large zone of medium-sized inventive steps. His view is that the big guns of intellectual property law should not be deployed in defense of modest innovations in this middle zone. Rather, we should deploy in the middle zone less formidable doctrinal systems, like utility models and petty patents and sui generis protections for new plant varieties, and so forth. As one might expect, he usually argues that such modest entitlements should be shielded only by liability rules. Meanwhile, patent law should be narrowed in scope limited to more substantial inventive steps. Now, not many of us, as I say, have as yet followed Jerry down this path, in part because it's messy. It's hard enough keeping track of the details of patent, copyright, and trademark law. Do we really have to also monitor the myriad lower level rules, not just in our own countries, but globally? Perhaps we should. I want to close with a few words, not about the substance of Jerry's work, on which I've been concentrating, but about his style. At least as influential as Jerry's scholarship has been his role as colleague and mentor. In those capacities, Jerry has been a saint, kind, generous, and respectful. This is, of course, most obvious to the beneficiaries of his aid and support. But these traits are also visible in his published comments on other people's work. When asked, as we all sometimes are, to react to other scholars' reform proposals, for example, concerning the use of compulsory licenses by developing countries to increase access to patented medicines, Jerry does not withhold criticism, 
but he invariably adopts the best version of an argument with which he disagrees, not the worst or the most vulnerable. He readily concedes sound points made by an opponent, and he never engages an ad hominem attack. We could all do well to emulate him. Good afternoon, once again, everybody. I'm the chair of the first session. I have the absolute honor of chairing this session one of this conference today being held to honor Professor Jerry Reichman. Jerry's poignant writings and his personal humility has been a beacon of light in the world of IP and development. So it's a real honor, Jerry. I'd like to invite my panelists, uh, Professor Keith Maskus, Professor George Lerner, Dr. Karsten Fink, and Dr. Bowen Sampers now to the podium. In the debate on IP and development, there have been many critical junctures where the academic and policy community has grappled for evidence, justification, and measurement of effects. This highly eminent panel of economists here today has worked on several of these important questions of innovation and globalization empirically verifying, and sometimes, I dare say, adding more doubt rather than resolving, which I, as an economist myself, subscribe to as part of a healthy debate. So without further ado, their bios are available to all of you electronically. I would like to invite them to share with us some of their work and raise more questions than answers. Should I go ahead? Right, so good afternoon to everyone. It's of course a great pleasure to be here and uh, let me you know, thank uh, Ruth, Irene and uh, Justin for this uh, invitation um, to um, come to Cambridge uh, um, to honor Jerry Reichman and I'd also like to you know, briefly, because we are under time pressure here, you know, pay tribute to Jerome uh, Reichman uh, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for some time and I think uh, you know, he really is a good example Maybe that from the perspective of you know, someone who has a bit of a role of a you know, recipient also of academic research work. Good example of someone who um, you know, really has shaped uh, in many ways thinking but also practice on intellectual property law. Um, because, so we have 12 minutes, is this correct, Padma? Because of the time limitation, this is going to be a bit of a tour de force without some of the nuance that I usually like to convey. I'd like to revisit a little bit the role of intellectual property in industrial development. Uh, and in so doing, I'll draw mainly on a book chapter that um, I contributed um, last year with a colleague at WIPO, Julio Raffo, um, to honor another scholar who's here, Pedro Roffer, um, you know, where we address this question. But I'll also include a little bit um, of um, research uh, that uh, I've conducted with Bronwyn Hall and Christian Helmers based on a um, firm level um, um, research project uh, that uh, we had in Chile and that looks at intellectual property use. Of course, I have to point out my views are personal and not institutional. Now let me start off and motivate my presentation essentially with three premises that I think should, um, you know, should be fairly uncontroversial. The one is that, of course, we still live in a world where there are wide differences in levels of economic development in economies uh, per capita incomes. Um, secondly, patterns of technology diffusion go a long way in explaining these differences. Uh, not sure who's familiar here with the work of Diego Comin, but I think he has some nice papers where he makes that point empirically. And the third premise is that public policies really matter, and they really matter especially when it comes to technology acquisition and diffusion, because as economists, we know that these processes are characterized by many market failure that justify various types of government intervention. Now, and due to time pressure, I'm not going to go into detail, and many of you know this, of course, if one looks at the development history over the last 40 years, you know, one sees that, um, you know, especially the East Asia region has seen much faster economic growth than 
other regions uh, in the world. Um, you know, over a span of four decades, you have essentially seen a quadrupling of um, 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 GDP per capita. Also interesting in the case of East Asia, you know, the East Asian financial crisis of the 19, late 1990s, which was highly significant at the time, if you look at it, you know, from today's perspective, really only appears as a small aber aberration of what otherwise is, is really a, a, a persistent uh, growth trend. There is, of course, there are numerous papers, you know, that sort of try to explain what is East Asia's success, and, you know, they talk about the role of industrial policy. Um, I'm going to skip that because I do want to focus a little bit the discussion on, on patents. Um, now, if you look at, you know, um, sort of what people have written about it, do patents matter in this industrial development process? Now, on the one hand, you know, there would be a camp who would argue that, yes, they matter. Maybe they matter in a negative way in a sense that they prevent imitation. And, you know, scholars often point, you know, to the early industrial development stages of what are today's high-income um, economies and argue that, you know, they sort of, um, you know, had lax uh, standards of intellectual property protection and very much relied on imitation of foreign technology. I think another good example is India's pharmaceutical industry. India, in the early 1970s, um, abolished product uh, patent protection. I think Bhavan is going to talk um, about uh, India in his presentation. Um, but just to say that, you know, since the 1970s, the Indian pharmaceutical industry has seen tremendous growth. It's one of the biggest pharmaceutical industries um, in the world. I think there were other factors, you know, that um, supported that, but I think it's not unreasonable to say the fact that they could, you know, um, copy, you know, Western drugs as they were invented, uh, you know, was uh, helpful for the development of the industry. On the other hand, you have the examples, and, you know, I reduced it here to the Republic of Korea and China, um, you know, where you could argue that, you know, their proactive attitude towards patenting was quite important in enabling their export-led uh, growth. Uh, so the way the story is often told about the Republic of Korea, that in the 1980s, you know, there was a pivotal moment when Samsung was sued by Texas Instruments uh, for infringement of semiconductor patents. And um, policymakers and executives in Korea realized, well, if we want to compete in this industry, we need to have our own patent portfolio. And, you know, that really changed the attitude uh, towards uh, patenting in Korea. Um, and, you know, that uh, was important uh, for um, Korean companies uh, to participate in what, you know, is not only um, semiconductors, what generally, you know, one can characterize as complex technology industries, and you could argue that, you know, China very much uh, followed uh, Korea's uh, experience in that regard. There, of course, is quite a bit of econometric cross-country research uh, on this question. You know, is there a linkage between patent protection and, and economic growth, industrial output? Uh, I listed a few studies here. There are others. Most of them actually do find, you know, a positive relationship between, you know, patent protection on the one hand and, and economic uh, growth. Uh, I still look at, you know, these studies uh, with some skeptical eye. There are hard to overcome measurement problems, endogeneity problems. You know, we don't know what happens first. Uh, you know, is it, um, you know, economic development that drives demand for greater patent protection or is it the other way around? I think it's also important to appreciate, and you know, this is something that I think is often overlooked. Um, you know, many people who sort of look at the effects of, you know, um, the introduction, for example, of TRIPS standard patent protection in developing economies, simply assuming that all patents are protected, but that's clearly not the case. Uh, patents don't seamlessly flow from, say, the rich world to developing economies. We did this exercise at WIPO. We sort of um, identified all the you know, global patent families and asked the question, well, how many of them have equivalents uh, in middle-income economies? And it turns out that you know, if you leave aside you know, China, um, less than 3% of global patent families actually have an equivalent in developing economies, or at least in the middle-income countries that you see here. Um, and you could either interpret a, that as good news, you could say, well, hey, that's great. You know, there are lots of inventions that are not subject to exclusive rights in these economies and that they could be the basis, you know, for um, technology acquisition. On the other hand, it's also quite clear that, 
you know, the reason they don't, um, there, there aren't, you know, that many patents in these countries is because, you know, there is no imitative threat uh, as such. And, you know, there's a question of whether, you know, the technology capacity exists uh, to acquire technology. Now, in the case of the Republic of Korea, you know, the numbers are a bit higher. Interestingly, if you look at China, as China has grown and as the innovation economy in China has grown, so has the interest of foreigners to protect their patents in China. Um, so in China, um, more than or close to a quarter of the world's patents, if you want to put it this way, have an equivalent uh, in, in China. Which does raise the question, and you know, maybe this is just going to be a footnote here, but I get uh, this question all the time. So at least I want to give the statistical answer, because I think not many people know the statistical answer. Is China special? Now, every year we put out this chart here, which is essentially you know, the history of the patent system going back to the 19th century. And you know, this is essentially the history as it was 10 years ago, where you had uh, Japan and the United States still as the countries accounting for most patent filings, and China at about uh, 250,000. Um, if you look at the same chart essentially last year, you know, you would see the tremendous growth that has happened uh, over the last 10 years and more than um, or close to 1.5 million patents being filed in, in China right now. Now, I think in many ways China is special, but statistically, I think it's important to point out if you look at this on a per capita basis or on an R&D dollar basis, it turns out that, you know, China is pretty much in line and actually... I mean, the numbers, these are 2015 numbers. The numbers have grown a little bit since then. But um, it is not uh, too far away from you know, Japan, Korea, and the United States. And based on these statistics, you could, you know, as I did earlier, very much argue that you know, um, what we see in China is, is very much sort of a replication of what we've seen in Korea and earlier in history in the case uh, of uh, Japan. I think if there is one thing that's statistically different about China is that, in some sense, China reached that level while still being a middle-income country and not, unlike Korea, um, you know, having already been a high-income country. Um, a few perspectives from Chile. I mean, one of the reasons we were interested in this is precisely to get rid of this cross-country perspective and really look at what is happening in particular countries. So we had a big data, I mean, it's not a big data, it's a, it was a big project involving data, um, where we worked with the Chilean Intellectual Property Office and the Statistical Institute, you know, essentially combining the IP registry with the manufacturing census and the survey, innovation survey data, essentially covering two decades where Chile, Chile transitioned from a middle-income country into a high-income country. We first of all looked at what explains intellectual property use in Chile over this period, and what we found there is that the determinants were pretty similar to what other studies find in high-income countries. Not surprising, patenting, for example, is more likely for larger capital-intensive and exporting firms. You know, we find more patenting relative in, in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry. Um, but if we then look at you know, whether patenting itself its uh, IP use itself makes an important difference in firm performance, and in particular, at total factor productivity growth, we don't find any effect which is different from what many studies in, in high-income countries find. We essentially, you know, what the Chilean data, in a sense, tells us is that we have manufacturing firms, you know, some of them seeing relatively rapid growth, and at some point, they turn to the IP system, but it's not that the, you know, the acquisition of IP rights you know, makes a big difference in their um, subsequent uh, performance. We did um, 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 have one interesting finding um, as part of this research when sort of looking at detailed innovation behavior as it comes from the innovation surveys, we did find that trademarks matter for new to market product innovation. So there was a clear positive association and that is sort of in line with with what we also know from a lot of studies that have been conducted in different parts of the world, that one important way of benefiting innovation, appropriating innovation investments, is through branding, through first mover advantage. And that channel seems to be of you know, much greater relevance uh, in you know, the specific context uh, of Chile um, uh, than, than, than patenting. Um, let me conclude. Uh, 
if I have uh, one minute. Uh, yeah. The first thing I want to say is that, um, and you know, there's almost um, you know, economists on the one hand, you know, have you know spend years trying to you know find a, a sort of an automatic relationship. You know, is there something we can find about the relationship between patent protection and 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 uh, and subsequent economic development. Uh, I would, at this point, doubt you know, that there's an unambiguous IP development link that is waiting to be discovered. I think you know, it all depends on the national context at the end of the day. And also, you know, economists really you know, wouldn't advise countries you know, just to focus on the patent system. You know, I think we would generally advise that you know, things need to be properly sequenced. You know, if you don't have the right financial mechanisms to support innovation, you know, the best patent system in the world is not going to do something, um, yeah, the patent system is not going to do some, uh, something for you. Now, I want to come back to what I said at the beginning, you know, the lack of a clear answer to that question does not mean that the question is not important in a sense that, you know, how to incentivize and uh, knowledge acquisition and knowledge diffusion, I think, is a really important question that is, in a sense, fundamental for the development process, which then raises the question, well, then how should we think about intellectual property in the process of industrial policy formulation? And the one thing that, at least in this chapter, we advocate is to integrate intellectual property into you know, what I call here smart specialization approaches. You know, smart specialization is, is the paradigm that Dominique Fauré at EPFL in Lausanne you know, has advocated and that has formed quite a bit of take up in Europe. But there are, you know, similar um, approaches that I think, you know, advocate more or less the same with different words. You know, the basic approach is to say, uh, or is to, is, is to start with a discovery process and ask what are the existing capabilities and constraints to growth in a particular context. And that may well sometimes mean in a region of a particular economy, and um, you know, have an um, all-inclusive discovery process you know, that sort of clearly crystallizes uh, what are the constraints to growth, and then ask the question, well, how does IP fit in there? And in many cases, there may well be the answer, well, IP may not be the most important uh, thing to focus on because you know, in the, uh, you know, if they're not sufficient uh, uh, researcher skills, if you know the financial mechanisms are not there, you know focusing on IP may not be uh, the right focus. In other circumstances, you know um, uh, the best thing that a patent office can do is to say focus on patent landscaping, and you know um, um, in in some sense give in, provide information on what kind of technologies <coughs> exist and where they are protected. And in other cases, um, you know, the best uh, thing one can do is actually to help local entrepreneurs and ask the question, how can they effectively use the intellectual property system? You know, we just did a major study on indus industrial designs in, in, in Southeast Asia and came to the conclusion that this is actually a form of protection that's quite relevant, you know, for many creative uh, um, um, firms in those countries and, and you know, they do face lots of challenges in effectively using the system and enforcing their rights. Let me stop here. Um, I'm out of time. Again, there are a lot more nuances that ideally I'd like to convey, um, but um, um, yeah, time is up. So I think Josh is next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carsten. Josh. Of course, it's a great pleasure to be here. Great occasion. Um, let me figure out how to get these slides open. I don't see any slides whatsoever, I'm afraid. I'm completely useless. Uh, no. I'm going to need a little help about the slides here. I know they must be here somewhere, but I can't find them. Do you think anyone would know? Check the top folder. Top one, counterpoint, PowerPoint. PowerPoint. OK. Today is Thursday. Here we are. Wow. Your job. It worked. It worked. <laughs> All right. I'm guilty of um, having a talk here that's probably more, um, more suited for a, a Castro-esque three-hour monologue. Instead, I find myself at 
Democratic debates, fighting uh, Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris to get a word in. So uh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to go fast. And uh, definitely, uh, you know, I guess this is another example that democracy sucks, right? <laughs> All right, so we clearly, I'm going to talk about a little bit of work that, um, that Jean Tarot and myself have done over the last decade or so looking at standard setting and the issues around, you know, certainly one of the trade offs that uh, Terry had highlighted in terms of intellectual property, which is the sort of problems induced by the, by the proverbial uh, patent, patent, uh, patent thicket. And in general, it's striking, right, that, you know, I spend a lot of my time doing research in venture capital, and venture capital you can find for almost any clause in terms of the contracts that are out there. You know, half a dozen law review articles, including economic articles, analyzing the nuances of the provision. On the other hand, standard setting is a hugely important institution. But when you look at how much we understand from either the law or the economic side in terms of how these things work, especially from an academic perspective, it's striking how much we don't know rather than how much we know. So our um, our agenda has tried to look at how these loops work, both from an economic perspective, but also informed by data and uh, input from practitioners as we've, uh, as we've proceeded. Of course, the problems are ones that are pretty familiar to uh, most of us, which is the you know, sort of patent thicket issue, that you essentially can have a situation where both um, new entrants are, are, are deterred from coming in because of overlapping intellectual rights, where you can get all sorts of rent seeking, and we know that there's been tremendous issues with uh, patent trolls and the like in many, uh, in, many, in many industries. And standard setting audit bodies, which along with patent pools, are you know, some of the primary institutions who try to go about the process of clearing the thicket and addressing some of these, addressing some of these issues. So sorry, Mr. Edison. Google, Facebook, and Microsoft claim they all own your patent. So, I mean, that, that's essentially what we're trying to solve, right? Um, standard setting bodies play a variety of roles here. Um, you know, clearly they're going to be more central in cases where one has concerns about interoperability. It's going to be much more important in information technology than in pharmaceuticals, for instance, where a drug is a drug and it's either going to cure cancer as opposed to you know, a, a phone where there's many different aspects of it. Standard setting bodies have a lot of structures, but at a most fundamental kind of level, these guys are playing two roles. First of all, they're saying, when a technology challenge emerges, what are the potential solutions that are out there? Secondly, when there is some sort of very viable alternative, they play what we kind of call a melding function of bringing together these different technologies and hammering out some sort of solution. And then thirdly, they play a role of regulating you know, bad behavior. And in particular, they typically do so by uh, the requirements around licensing fees, as well as about disclosure during the standardization, standardization process. Obviously, this is a big deal, right, in the sense that the potential financial advantages of getting one's intellectual property included in standards, even under the various curves that we'll talk about in a minute, can be still you know, a gusher of cash. I think probably the most uh, visible example here would be Qualcomm, which is you know, essentially used as a patent portfolio, you know, thrives within standards to you know, generate many billions of dollars of, uh, many billions of dollars of, of, of profits. Um, one of the points that we emphasize in our work is the importance of competition to these standard bodies. And in particular, what we see is that you know, there is not only uh, uh, diversity in terms of the formality of groups, you've got standard setting organizations themselves, often linked to governments and very formalized. You've got standard uh, you know, special interest groups and others which often operate in much more formal kind of ways. And we certainly see many examples where we see people engaged in what we call forum shopping, or basically trying to choose 
the appropriate standardization body to pursue their intellectual property. And as we'll talk about in a minute, this, is, this process of form shopping can be hugely uh, challenging in terms of the efforts of groups to regulate bad behavior in the standardization, in the standardization process. When we think about the uh, challenges which are which are out there, certainly you know there is uh, you know any number of issues we could we could we could highlight, but certainly one of them is the inherent ambiguity associated with the intellectual property. The fact that for multiple firms may have relevant intellectual property, and there often are uh, you know can't, you know certainly very real 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 choices in terms of what's there. Secondly, one has the issue that uh, there have been numerous efforts by standard setting bodies to seek the behavior of their members, which have been in some cases of limited efficacy. We allude here to two famous cases, one involving Gill, where they were ultimately sanctioned and forced, you know, essentially to agree not to uh, not to license uh, the, or not to garner revenue from some patents that they didn't disclose to a, a, a standardization body. But one also can see examples like Rampus, where at least my interpretation of it is that they engaged in far more egregious behavior and ultimately largely ended up uh, escaping without much in terms of significant, uh, significant sanctions. Part of the challenge in this process is that the kinds of rules that govern standardization, and particularly the rules around fees, are in comparatively ambiguous. In particular, the dominant phrase that appears is uh, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory for, uh, uh, for essential patents. Particularly that notion of fairness, as to what is a fair royalty, is something that is extremely difficult to define and adjudicate. There certainly have been efforts to say, well, $4.50 is not reasonable, but $0.36 cents is. But as one can imagine, this is an inherently subjective and challenging area, particularly given the difficulties of assessing what the value of the products are, and in particular, what the contributions of individual pieces of intellectual property are, are, are fair. There's been a variety of efforts to try to do this. You know, for instance, IEEE has tried to define in a much more explicit way what reasonableness is in terms of what it's going to take, with I think what you could argue is mixed success. Certainly, there have been a number of efforts to promote royalty free licensing, saying why not just simply give the patents away for free and then we don't have any fun to scale prices. It's just that as economists, we generally sort of think that we need to have some sort of incentive to innovate. And if you know at the end of the day the price is in fact is zero, then it might have a bit of a dampening effect in terms of your ability to pursue innovation. So the area where John and I have spent some time thinking about has been around this notion of is there a better way to do things rather than to rely on the grant commitments, given the inherent difficulty of defining what fair and reasonableness is in terms of uh, in terms of licensing licensing rates, and in particular, what we've proposed in a couple of uses is a notion which we call structured price commitments, where essentially the standardization process continues as it does now. There's a discovery phase; people talk about what the relevant intellectual property is. There's ultimately uh, a choosing phase where the set of technologies that are going to be part of the standard are identified. And then finally, you know, there's essentially implementing in whatever way there. But where there's inserted a middle phase before the commitments are made, where essentially one has, uh, one has uh, what might be described as a, a, a recess, where firms commit to a price cap or to a number where the, uh, they say we will not license this set of patents or above a given price. And the idea is that, that in that kind of situation, the, the size of the commitment, what that cap is, and what the costs of the patents are, may in 
standards set in time in terms of choosing which technology they would like to submit on the devices. There's lots of things one could argue about. Um, you could argue about saying, are they going to game the system by setting too high a price cap? We've said it probably not. But one question which I think is, or an objection which, which is out there, relates to the issues that we talked about before about the form shopping that is possible for some sorts of products. And in particular, whether we will see that an effort by a standardization body to set and impose these kind of rules will just be met with a response of people trying to go to another standardization body and which doesn't require price caps. And indeed, that's exactly what we uh, what we see. That when, for instance, uh, uh, you know, one standard organization body tried to impose price commitments, you know, Motorola not only said we're not playing with you, but they launched an active campaign to essentially decertify this as a standardization body and created enormous havoc, which really very much weakened the effectiveness of the system. We argue that if this stuff, if the strategy is going to be effective, it almost invariably is going to start happening. It's going to have to be imposed <coughs> top down by the regulator, demanding that standardization bodies put structured price commitments in there, because essentially the free market, the form up, form shopping process, will undo the efforts of any individual standardization body to do this, do this stuff. We have lots of interesting things to talk about. Let's just bring it to the end. Hopefully, I've convinced you that standardization process is a complicated one, that standard setting bodies are really interesting economic and legal institutions, that there's a lot more to understand about their processes, but there's also some real room for reform and improvement. So, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Keith. Okay, well, while I'm trying to find my slides, see if economists are learning individuals here. Um, I probably can't. Yeah. You gotta go there. It's, the, it's crazy apple. Where? Yeah, I'm not, I don't do apple. So is it It's PowerPoint? a red little dot there. The red this dot. This one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Oh, okay, here we are. Okay. So while those are coming up, let me uh, say a few things that uh, are relevant for understanding Jerry Rickman. <laughs> so probably all you need to know about Jerry is this conference is in his honor and he's the one person with a yellow pad taking deep notes. <laughs> I've seen him do this many times, always. I've never not seen you do that, Jerry. Uh, and I'm really wondering where these cases of notes are that you've had over the <laughs> um, A couple of other things. One is uh, this panel of economists is pretty eclectic. You figured this out, we're all over the map. I had something to do with putting this together, and this is by design, actually, because Jerry's interests are so wide-ranging. He's written stuff that's relevant to everything that we're gonna be uh, discussing here. Uh, and so it's really in his honor that we, we put it together this way. But then I, I just wanna thank Jerry personally. Uh, uh, so um, I first got to know him uh, 25 years ago or so, uh, when he and Pedro Rofi uh, put together a small group of, I think mostly lawyers, uh, to write a piece of, on behalf of UNCTAD uh, describing and analyzing this thing called the TRIPS agreement that the Uruguay around, which is very new. And as far as I know, that was the first sort of real piece that was put out on, on the subject. And I can imagine Jerry uh, wondering, well, we need an economist who's out there, and he found a paper of mine and got, got me involved. And I have to say this has been, for me, a, a, a wonderful uh, bit of my career uh, for many reasons, but I'll just tell you, the, the one reason, I think, why there's so few international economists like me who write about intellectual property is because the entry barriers to understanding what it's about are huge. <laughs> and I never would have uh, tried to, to break through those barriers myself if it hadn't been for my relationship with Jerry and all of you over that time, so I appreciate that. And uh, so for me, this paper that I'm gonna talk about today uh, is a little bit of a back to the future because the 
paper that I think Jerry found that I wrote at the time was called How Trade Related Are Intellectual Property Rights? So a paper about the TRIPS Agreement. And this paper, I could rewrite or retitle as How Trade Related Are Preferential Trade Agreements That Have TRIPS Plus Chapters In. And that's basically what this paper is about. So um, let's, I'll try to get through this quickly. Uh, okay. Now, uh, before I do that, uh, a few of you, like Peter and Rochelle and, uh, and Thomas, you, you've heard me talk about this before, so my apologies for saying this again, but I'm gonna try to really make it much shorter this time, <laughs> a little easier to understand. Uh, so, there are now over about 400 preferential trade agreements in the world, quite a bit more if you uh, uh, sort of be more rigorous about it. Um, but preferential trade agreements with IP chapters in them are fairly recent phenomena. And so there you are. So what you see here is, is the red bars are trade agreements that have been put together bilaterally or more, more often uh, plurilaterally, minilaterally, whatever word you want to use, that have in them elevated IP chapters. So what we refer to as, as, as you all prefer to refer to as TRIPS plus uh, uh, chapters in them. And the linkages among these are really complex. So the left-hand side shows you a map of the world uh, in 1995. The red uh, nodes or, or, or links between nodes uh, are basically IP plus kinds of chapters and trade agreements. And the reason there's that uh, blob in Europe is because the European Union was about the only place at that time that had them. Uh, the United States with, uh, believe it or not, Jordan had one at that time. Um, now here you are in, in 2010 on the right, you can just see how these things have mushroomed over time. So uh, about 50 uh, PTAs as of a few years ago have these chapters in them. Most involve a developed country partner, uh, but some of the new South-South preferential trade agreements have these kinds of IP chapters in them as well. And uh, just to show you um, what, again, this is another variant of the proliferation of these agreements. There are something like 82 countries that are in trade agreements that have these IP chapters in them, um, and then something like close to 50 such agreements. The United States doesn't have that many such agreements, uh, and uh, because uh, its, its agreements tend to be within one or two countries at a time, um, there aren't so many countries involved, but of course the United States does have very extensive requirements when it puts one of these agreements together. And then on the right you have the European Union and the European Free Trade Agreement, uh, with the number of countries involved there, and that's a much larger number because, you know, if you're in the European Union or EFTA, then necessarily you, you adopt these kinds of uh, rules. So this paper is really the first attempt at, at the most basic question. So do these IP-related trade agreements have exceptional effects on member countries' trade flows? And again, deja vu for me, um, in 1995, the Americans, certainly in the Europeans to some uh, lesser degree, were arguing, Jishri would know this better than anyone, and Thomas, you guys are negotiating this thing, that uh, you had to have these strong and relatively harmonized intellectual property rights because not having that was a distortion to trade, among other arguments they made. Nobody knew that. There was never no evidence whether that was true or not. So the paper that I referred to 25 years ago was about that, uh, and we don't, at, right now have any sense of whether that's true in the context of these trade agreements uh, with IP chapters in them. So again, the question is puzzling. The, the Americans and the Europeans put so much negotiating capital into this, and the, uh, the, the lobbyists who are pushing them put so much of their effort into it. You have to ask yourself, why? I mean, is there really a payoff of some kind to it? And uh, you know, nobody's actually studied that question before. So what about uh, on trade in specific IP sensitive sectors? I mean, all of you know as well as anyone that these TRIPS plus standards are pretty targeted on pharmaceuticals, uh, on medical devices, um, on chemicals, on, uh, on information technologies. Uh, so what about those, okay? Um, and a couple of uh, sort of background comments. Uh, IP rights in trade agreements differ fundamentally from tariff cuts, and this is another way Another reason, I should say, why trade economists sort of shy away from these kinds of behind-the-border regulatory questions beside the fact that they're really hard to measure. Um, and that is tariff cuts 
for trade economists are like patents data for innovation economists. They're there. <laughs> There's a lot of it, and you can actually analyze them. Trade flows are, are, are easily found, and tariff rates are easily found. And so you can analyze what happens in the context of preferential tariff cutting pretty easily. And we know that that's going to be discriminatory against non-members and preferential for members. But these IP chapters, of course, as, as you all know, they, they have to be uh, implemented on an MFN basis. So there's no discrimination. And that has all kinds of implications that economists need to study and understand better. But uh, for two observations here, one is I think this is ratcheting up global protection for IP much more than people might recognize. Uh, and, then, uh, and then secondly, it's really hard to sort of think about the economic impacts of this kind of thing when what you're doing is changing technology-oriented uh, regulations on an MFN basis, but within a preferential trade agreement. So is that sort of de facto discriminatory or isn't? I mean, these are big questions, and I'm not going to be able to answer them with this paper, uh, but it's a, it's a big research agenda. Probably will go on beyond the time I'm done with this uh, kind of work, but, uh, but I'm hoping, once again, to try to spark a, a literature in this context. Um, so the analysis that um, my co-author and I do here uh, is to use a difference in difference approach to study effects on imports and exports, very specific imports and exports, um, and uh, to try to separate out in the context of these trade agreements what's going on uh, because of the IP chapters and what's going on because of uh, sort of prior commitments to trips, plus all the other things that are going on here as well. So. Um, identification is very difficult here, uh, and um, I don't know if there are any economists in here, a few, a few sitting to my right to be sure, they'll, they're going to question a lot of this, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, let me just sort of walk you through it. Um, we, we actually have three differences here that we rely on to try to identify some impacts here. First, some countries, a subset of countries, joined an IPA with either the United States or Europe, and we think of those agreements as what we call our treatment countries, because those agreements have in them the IP trips plus expectations that are stronger than the other agreements do. So if you're a country that joins one of them, you are agreeing to pretty substantial increases in IP protection. Other countries that have not joined such an agreement, uh, we consider like a control group, the group against which we're going to tra compare trade effects. So we put in here a dummy variable for the year of joining one of these agreements uh, and, and, and after that. We also break uh, these groups down into four income groups by development level. That will become clear as I go along. Um, and there's also uh, differences in dates at which countries came into compliance with TRIPS. So what we're doing here is we're looking at countries that are already compliant with TRIPS. That doesn't mean that the year they joined TRIPS, it means the year that they actually came into compliance through the various kinds of notification requirements. And then joined an IP agreement with elevated IP expectations after that. So we're going to try to look at conditional effects on trade. Second difference uh, is we argue that the effects should differ between high IP sectors and low IP sectors using various definitions. And specifically, what I'm going to show you today is these quite specific industries. Um, but this is important. Um, again, our, our, our specification focuses on effects in countries uh, joining IPAs after becoming compliant with TRIPS, because we want to try to sort these two things out. Third difference is to permit effects to vary across groups of countries, as I said. Big endogeneity problem. Anytime you do this kind of thing, a uh, little comment on economics. When that paper I mentioned earlier, 25 years ago, uh, when that was published, people didn't pay nearly as much attention to identification and endogeneity as they do now. So that paper would have a hard time being published now. Maybe this one will as well, but uh, we'll see. So one response um, that we make here is that these standards in these preferential trade agreements likely were uh, kind of exogenously implemented in most of these trade partners. But what do I mean by that? It's not likely, we would argue, that uh, countries like Peru uh, would agree to uh, IP chapter, uh, the IP requirements that exist in the Peruvian-US agreement on their own. They wouldn't select them as a matter of, of, of policy choice. Um, and then, um, you know, why would they agree to these uh, uh, preferential trade agreements? Well, it's because they think they're gaining some market access or something like that. But there's still an issue of endogeneity that you might not uh, 
believe from that context. So what we're gonna do here to try to be as rigorous as we can, besides having all kinds of batteries uh, of fixed effects, is to estimate the effects of these agreements on trade with external countries that are not members of the particular agreement. So the endogeneity issue is pretty clear, or the causality issue is pretty clear. It may well be, I don't really think so, but it's possible that Peru would join an agreement with the United States because its IP sectors think that it's gonna export more to the United States. Uh, and so there is this question of, of, of selection. But we argue that it's not that likely that they're gonna join such a thing if the effect or if they're expecting the effect to be increased exports or increased trade with countries that are not part of the agreement. So we're looking at this external trade question. Uh, okay, a uh, little quickly, all right. Just, there's the data. <laughs> you know, if you don't know if anything I need to say about that. There are, by the way, 24 treatment uh, IPAs here. So you can guess what they are. All right, so. <clears throat> Control group is uh, all countries in the world that have data, trade data with the UN that are not any of these, in the, any of these 24 treatment IPAs. Okay, um, so what do we do here? We estimate the differential effects of IPAs and TRIPS on uh, aggregate trade, gravity model on, on bilateral trade at the uh, sort of aggregate level for low IP and high IP goods. But the one I wanna focus on or show you some results on today is this last one, a gravity model of bilateral trade in detailed high IP sectors, the ones that are the subject of much of these TRIPS-related requirements. Uh, okay, I think we can go, just pass on through this. Um, yeah, so this is kind of important. When you see these coefficients or the results, interpret them as effects on trade in comparison with what's going on in countries that are not within the IPA. So negative coefficients don't, don't necessarily mean a reduction in ab absolute trade, but a reduction, a reduction relative to what, what these other countries are experiencing. Okay, so um, way too many results to go through, so I'm just gonna focus on these bilateral, very detailed trade regressions. Just for the fun of it, because I know how much my attorney friends enjoy seeing this kind of thing, there's the regression equation. Okay. Anybody wanna complain about it? There you go. Okay. Um, so uh, what we find here, now you understand this, these are really high uh, data exercises, There's like four million observations in this next regression I'm gonna show you. So um, the export outcomes here uh, are precisely estimated. Let me just show you what, talk about what the results are and then I can flash through the coefficients for you. It turns out we're finding that both TRIPS compliance and membership in one of these IP agreements actually diminish, and this is a relative statement compared to other countries that are not in these, countries, these agreements, diminish low IP exports in nearly all income groups. So the low IP sectors are the ones that you might think, so commodities, minerals, um, some of the sort of labor intensive kinds of products. Even in the really poor countries, the low income countries, in comparison with non countries that don't join these agreements and looking at their exports to other countries outside the agreements, what we find is there's a reduction in their exports of products that you would, might expect they would have a comparative advantage in. Uh, sorry, back, backing this up again. Um, but they do generate significant increases in the exports of um, analytical instruments, biopharmaceuticals, medical devices, um, and I can't even remember now what, uh, some kind of production technologies, whatever that is, in, in these uh, groups of countries, pretty much across the board, especially in emerging economies. Uh, and there's, a, there's an increase in biopharmaceutical exports from the high income countries. Um, so there are the coefficients. Uh, I don't want to spell, oh, I thought that they were. Oh, there they are. Okay, so just briefly, if you look at the first column, that's low IP exports. Uh, and there's a negative coefficient pretty much throughout for these IP related, sometimes for the TRIPS agreements for the low income economies. Most of the other coefficients are positive and significant. So in the higher IP sectors like biopharmaceuticals, with a few exceptions, you get really large and elastic respect, uh, responses here. This is just a graphical representation of it, but, but if, if any of these bars is fully ab above the dotted line, that means it's a quite significant statistical effect, and if you look at biopharmaceuticals there, you can see that there's a big positive export effect, okay? Um, 
Uh, I think I'm just going to go right through the import effects. They're more uh, variable. Um, there is a story here about uh, an increase in imports in uh, biopharmaceuticals into the middle income and lower income economies, which is interesting and is consistent with prior work in this area. But there you see it again. Okay. So are these effects significant? I'm nearly done here. To give you some sense of the magnitudes of all of this, um, There you are. What you see is that uh, in terms of the low IP goods, uh, what you, these IPA effects are negative and, and quite significant. 19, 53%. Don't be too surprised by the large percentage effects there because the average trade flow we're looking at is quite small. Okay? But nevertheless, these are, these are all quite substantial uh, relative to what we have been finding otherwise in this literature looking at aggregate trade effects. And then you can see the impacts, for example, on biopharmaceuticals exports are pretty substantial, especially for the middle income and high income economies. All right, so let me just wrap this up then. Um, so these results stand out. With, the, with uh, I didn't show you the aggregate data. I forgot to take this point out, but I can tell you. There is evidence of a sorting effect of these IPAs. And this is what really I think is most interesting about this research. Exports fall in low IP goods, but rise in high IP goods. TRIPS has similar effects, but this becomes quite pronounced when you get into the really detailed sectors. And as I said, there are notable impacts in specific high IP sectors, especially looking at uh, very detailed bilateral trade. So there's this sorting effect that st remains there. Um, and then uh, uh, imports are a little bit less systematic, but they're there as well. So what we find, just to, to summarize this, is that IPRs in IP-related PTAs, once again, are trade-related, but in this pretty limited, but nevertheless, I think, pretty important sense. There seems to be some payoff going on for these industry lobbyists. Please don't <coughs> misunderstand that this is some statement about welfare. It isn't. It's just a, an, an estimation of the trade effects of these agreements. Welfare is a much more complicated thing than that. But if you're a you know, high-tech pharmaceutical company, it suggests that these agreements are, in fact, once again, sorting out your trade incentives. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pete. Bye Thank you. Good, good afternoon. Hi, Jerry. Uh, um, so uh, as I was uh, asked to, uh, to reflect a little bit on, uh, uh, on, on some of Jerry's contributions to, to my thinking and, and, and present something uh, related to it, I started going through some of his, some of his old stuff. Um, and uh, I ran across one set of conference proceedings, or was it government testimony, when he said, he started by saying something like patents, trade, and IP all in 10 minutes. I can't do it. There's no time. And I'm feeling uh, so, sort of similarly in thinking about sort of Jerry's, thinking about Jerry's contributions to my own thinking as well as my own work. So I'm going to bite off just a, a little piece of it, focusing on the impact of TRIPS on, on drug prices, and in particular, the impact of, of the TRIPS agreement on drug prices in, in India. Um, as I think most people in this room know, and, and Keith just sort of uh, talked about, uh, you know, TRIPS uh, introduced to, to many developing countries which previously did not have product patents in pharmaceuticals. TRIPS basically uh, uh, compelled them to change their national patent laws uh, to, to change that. The reactions uh, among legal scholars and, and, and economists were, I think, mixed, and sometimes um, um, there was a lot of controversy. Um, there were some people saying that this might have an effect on innovation incentives, maybe for some kinds of innovation, maybe for some kinds of diseases. Um, and then on the other side, concern um, that I think was pretty widespread uh, that that trips that, that drug patent protection in developing countries would raise would raise drug prices, and 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 that could have significant welfare effects in the developing world. What's interesting about about um, Jerry's work in this area uh, in, the, in the 90s um, is not only that it was, that it was balanced, as, as was pointed out, and at least open at that time, um, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts now, Jerry, uh, to different logical possibilities of what would happen. Um, I think 
you know, Jerry pointed out then and has continued to since, uh, the idea that it's not binary, that TRIPS isn't simply turning patents from off to on uh, in, in developing countries, but the way in which the agreement is implemented is really going to mediate the outcomes. And you can even see here, uh, sort of normatively, uh, Jerry, Jerry advocating that countries take advantage of this sort of room for maneuver under TRIPS to try to uh, implement it in a, in a pro-competitive way. Um, um, I think, you know, using the term wiggle room in gray areas uh, uh, that are built into the agreement um, while still try to comply uh, in good faith with, with, with the laws. Um, and so that's quite interesting. And, and what I'm going to show you now is uh, both, you know, uh, how, uh, I guess what I'm going to argue now is the ways in which India implemented TRIPS, the, the specifics of how India implemented TRIPS are crucial for thinking about um, what sort of effects we're seeing on prices and interpreting the empirical literature on that and for thinking about um, whether what we've seen so far is likely to be indicative of what we see going forward. So that's a kind of preview. I'll just say very quickly that there is you know, a handful of influential empirical papers on the effects of of trips on drug prices in India. I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose two here today. But what's interesting is despite the expectations of just about everybody involved uh, in, 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 in sort of thinking about trips, uh, you know, these papers both show that drug patents in India had negligible effects on prices and on generic competition. Um, so this, this is sort of surprising. Let me give you a preview of these. Uh, actually, let me just give you an overview of these, sorry. Um, I already gave you a preview. Um, basically, this is, this is a paper by uh, Mark Duggan and colleagues. It was published in the American Economic Review not too long ago. Um, and I won't go into the details here, but what they find is when a patent hits a drug in India, the price goes up about between 3 and 5%. That's a very small number compared to expectations from simulation models of, uh, that, that were done on antibiotics and, other, and you know, segments of the antibiotic industry of 100 to 400% price increases. Um, and certainly uh, uh, compared to what we'd expect from, say, the US experience, where we see after patents expire, um, fairly rapid price erosion, you know, 50% or 66% or, or, or something like that or in one or two years. Um, and even, you know, what sort of civil society and the activists and I think a lot of legal scholars and economists expected. So they are sort of puzzled by this finding. I don't know if they're puzzled by it, but they're, they're trying to understand what's going on. And one, one explanation is, hey, it could be the case that what we've learned from rich countries does not apply to poor countries. It could be that the profit maximizing price is lower in India such that the monopoly, monopoly price is actually not that far away from, from the competitive price. Um, it could also be something about um, aspects of India's drug or or competition laws that explains this. So it could be compulsory licensing or price controls or something called Section 11, uh, 11A7 grandfathering, which was a sort of automatic compulsory license for, for certain drugs that were on the market um, um, before, trips, before trips hit. Um, so keep that in, your, keep that in mind. Um, there's another paper by Ernie Burnt and Ian Coburn published in Health Affairs around the same time. And their outcome variable is not prices, but competition the extent of generic competition on molecules that were introduced um, globally between 2000 and 2010, so <laughs> after, after TRIPS. And what they find is in India, both in an absolute sense and also as compared to other countries, there's much higher generic penetration for new molecules, for new drugs um, than, than um, we would expect and uh, than we see in, in other countries. What they argue is that this reflects India not implementing TRIPS with fidelity um, to, to, uh, you know, what it's, to, to what it's supposed to be. So essentially, you know, wiggling too much, taking too much advantage of the wiggle room um, to the point where they're essentially negating um, the, the intended impact of the agreement. A particular target in that discussion and, and in other related discussions is Section 3D of India's patent law, which, which Jerry has described as, a, you know, a strict non-obviousness standard, essentially, uh, uh, disallowing or restricting the grants of certain secondary patents that don't have um, um, uh, therapeutic benefits. And this was very controversial, the subject of the Gleevec Supreme Court case in India, for those of you familiar with that. Um, and then I won't get into this much, but they also argue that 
uh, this is this is actually this weak implementation of trips is actually hurting Indian consumers um, because it leads to launch lags. It leads firms not to launch as quickly as in India as they do in other countries, and thus the title, the, the hidden cost of low prices. Okay, so this is where. Um, we come in, um, and this is joint work with Ken Shadlin and, and, and newer joint work with, with Margaret Kyle. Um, so these and similar studies are used to argue one of two things. One is that India is circumventing its obligations under TRIPS and maybe hurting Indian consumers in, in the process. And a second, that you know, the, all the concern about TRIPS and high drug prices was in fact much ado about nothing. We're seeing not that, not that big effects. Um, however, um, there's, some, there's some issues one can raise with these papers. Okay. First, there's not much in the way of compulsory licensing in India. Um, none of the drugs, as far as we can tell, were under price control orders. Um, um, we don't know of any cases of this Section 11A7 grandfathering, and we've, we've kind of looked for these. Um, and then Section 3D, which Ken Shadlin and I have written a lot about over the years. If anything, over the years that are covered by these studies, Section 3D was kind of underutilized by a resource-constrained Indian Patent Office, not overutilized. Um, so for various reasons, and, and you'll just take my word for it now, but you can ask me more about it later, we don't think that these are very compelling explanations. Rather, and this is where the specifics matter, we think another aspect of TRIPS implementation um, is more important for understanding what's been going on so far and what we should expect to see going forward. Namely, unlike other countries, India took full advantage of the transition period and disallowed any patents with a priority year, um, the year first global filing before 1995. Um, other countries, such as Brazil, had a pipeline system. Um, and, you know, uh, India didn't do that. Why does this matter? And this is, you know, if you haven't been paying attention and, and, and you care, this is where you should pay attention. Um, because, uh, drugs, drugs have different kinds of patents. Okay, drugs have two or three patents, um, maybe some, sometimes more. Um, they'll have a strong patent, um, sometimes called a primary patent, covering the active ingredient, which you know is generally um, strong and has pretty clear boundaries and and and. Uh, um, is effective at keeping generics out. There's also a range of secondary patents that are often filed, so on formulations, dosage forms, new uses, things like that, that have more porous boundaries and are generally considered weaker. For drugs whose primary patent has a pre-1995 priority date, those drugs could only rely on, on this weaker secondary patent protection. Okay? And, and this is kind of the, the punchline, not the punchline, but this is the, the, a point, uh, that, that most new drugs approved until very, very recently are of this sort, including almost all of the drugs that are covered by the, the previous work that I, just, that I just talked about. Going forward, more and more drugs are going to have post-95 primary patents and get strong patents in India. And it's those patents and those drugs where we should be looking at the price effects to really kind of understand what's been going on so far and what we should expect going forward. And so Ken, Ken and I, in particular, have been arguing this for, for some time. We actually have some, some data now, and we teamed up with, with Margaret. And I'll just show you a preview. And I should mention as that these are preliminary findings, um, and you know, we're still kicking the tires. This is, I think, uh, you know, we, we just, we just uh, we're in the early stages of this. But I, um, um, well, that's just a caveat. OK, so for interest of time, I won't go through all, this, all of this, except to say this. Let's, let's focus on the second panel here. Um, this, this panel shows the US approval year, which we, on the bottom axis, which is we can think of as the global launch year of, of, of a drug. This is now all drugs approved since 1995. Okay, so all drugs, like, okay. Um, you know, up until relatively recently, you know, after, you know, post 2010, um, up until about 2010, the minority of drugs have a, pro have a primary patent uh, that's post 1995. Okay. So, and that's kind of the key point. It's because it takes a long time from patent filing to drug launch, you know, those things don't, 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 uh, uh, they move, they're kind of correlated as you can see with the, with the left graph, but, but it takes a long time. So it's only around here where we start to have a significant number of drugs that are the types of drugs we're going to expect going forward, which is drugs that don't just get a secondary patent in India, but get a primary patent as well. And it's, that, it's, it's those drugs that you want to look at to kind of look at the, the price impact of TRIPS. Um, so I, I too am going to skip over a lot of the, the gory details here. Um, suffice it to say, we look at all drugs approved 
between 1995 and essentially you know, the present, 2017, um, we, get, we collect information on their patents, both in the US and in India. We categorize these patents, or we rely on um, uh, a private firm to categorize these patents into primary versus secondary patents, and then we get information on, on prices and number of generic suppliers and, and things like that. Uh, okay. Uh, let me show one chart, and then I'll just sort of summarize the results so we can have a, so we can have a discussion here. So this chart just shows you um, uh, what's going on uh, uh, graphically. Um, so of the 500 drugs or so, uh, we can look at the share that have an Indian application. And so we're looking okay, only now in this chart at drugs that have any Indian patent application. So this chart is conditional on Indian patent application. What you'll see is that across all these drugs, right, uh, no matter what their priority are, about 80% of them have an Indian patent, right? About 80% of these drugs that, that where there's an Indian patent application have an Indian patent. But it's only starting in 1995 where we see drugs in India with primary patents. So this is where I say, you know, we've been saying this for a long time. So here are the data. It's only, you know, it's only post-95 that you see this. So what happens then if you start to look at the price effects of those, of those patents in India? So that's what we do. Um, I, I have only two minutes left, so I don't want to, uh, yeah, I don't want to abuse that. Let's just, let me do the regressions were run. Okay. Basically, what we find <laughs> is uh, that overall, consistent with all the previous research that I just summarized, uh, patents have very small effects on patents in, uh, on, on sorry prices and generic competition. However, across all specifications, if we look at primary patents, drugs with primary patents, uh, they have 65 to 200 percent higher prices than drugs in the same class um, that are observable, similar on other observable observable characteristics. For the economists in the house, we also do an instrumental variable thing where we instrument for uh, the probability of getting a primary patent with the post-95 indicator, and all the results go through and, in fact, get a little bit stronger. So um, why this matters? Going forward, as the long shadow of 1995 fades, more and more drugs in India are going to be post-95 drugs, and they're going to get primary patents in India. Um, the role of Section 3D will also change. So um, I know there's people in here who, who do work on India. Um, there's a lot of fights about Section 3D and whether it should be allowed and whether it's strip compliant and all this kind of stuff. What's interesting is that in the earlier era, because you couldn't get a primary patent because of this grandfathering, Section 3D could determine whether you got any patent in India at all if it knocked off the secondaries, right? So that's how Gleevec fell, basically, because its priority year was 1994. Going forward, Section 3D will affect the duration of patent protection, but it's not about primary patents. And under most reasonable interpretations of what Section 3D is supposed to do, you know, the primary patents are still going to hit, right? So the role of 3D is also going to change going forward, um, or so we think. OK, so let me end here. To the extent that these price increases are undesirable or affordable in India, um, going forward, we will have to think about other policy solutions or other types of wiggle room to ameliorate the effects. And fortunately, we have people in the room like, like Jerry who, um, who have thought about that problem. If I may just take, take 10 more seconds, um, I also just wanted to uh, personally thank Jerry for, for always being kind of supportive of my work and championing it, um, introducing me to people like, like Pedro and, and, others over, and others in this room over, over, over the years, um, coming to conferences I organized and being the only one who was still enthusiastic at the end of them, uh, taking notes, um, and, and really sort of being a role model for, for not just me, but you know, for, for, for other academics um, in, in, in this field. So thank you, um, I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Bhavan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all my four panelists for being outstanding and keeping time. So thank you very much for your cooperation. And we have about 30 minutes left, and I'd like to open up for uh, questions and answers. I'd like to first take a couple of questions, then allow my panel to respond, if that's okay with the panelists. Okay. All right. Please. Jeshri. My understanding, and this is not from any yeah. you know, statistical data, or anything, my understanding is that because nobody knew what was in the mailbox, 
the generic companies then went ahead and started manufacturing or started, you know, kind of uh, getting into the market for all those uh, which they thought were profit profitable, which had already come in into other markets by 2005, and they started getting in, and that is why they lobbied to get Section 11A up where they were doing meaningless. So they wanted it so that they could continue. And I thought that the previous studies that they found, because they said that despite the fact they looked at the patented drugs, they found very little uh, price increases. I thought that was because in all the major markets, or the most profitable drug markets, they had actually generic competition. And because the gen Indian generics were interested in making money, as all companies are, and they were targeting the most profitable drugs which were for which mailbox applications were in the pipeline. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what you did to look at how the Section 11A played sure. out. That sure. was one thing. And I also wanted to know whether the previous studies that you quoted, not the other one, I think uh, uh, Mark Duggan and, uh, and others, that uh, study, when they looked and they saw the 3 to 5 percent, hmm. uh, were they also looking at the same kind of uh, measure that you used, or was it a different measure? That's uh, yeah, good question. Any other questions? Okay, then, Bowen, please. Yeah. So, no, it's, it's you know, it's a... So, 11A7, um, no, I understand, you know, where it came from, and certainly there were generics on the market um, on mailbox drugs, yeah. Um, I've, you know... If, if it were a prominent thing, you would expect to see some, you know, somebody say something about it that, you know, it basically is an automatic compulsory license, right, where you have to pay reasonable royalties uh, to, if you're on the firm, if you're on the market and a patent hits. I mean, there's no, I mean, I, there's no record of that ever happening, essentially, right? So um, that's, that's it. I mean, I think I've asked you, I've asked Dr. Hamid, uh, and things like that. Now, nonetheless, let me, let me back up a little bit. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, the, the kind of, critique of the previous work doesn't rely on that point. It's just that's, that's more of an observation. Um, there are a lot of drugs on the market. I mean, uh, there's empirically, there's very few drugs on the market from the mailbox uh, which later get a product application, uh, sorry, uh, uh, that, that's covered by the, the Duggan sample, sample that later get a primary product uh, patent issued. Um, maybe like three or four or something like that, right? So I think that's the main thing that's going on there. Uh, it's more just an observation that I don't see any paper trail of 11A now. It might be the case it's the kind of thing that has an influence even if it doesn't leave a paper trail, but yeah. Uh, um, and, and we are using the same, we're, so we're using the same data. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's leave it at that. And I know you are as well, so we can talk about that a little more. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I see three hands, so Thomas first. Um, thank you. Um, I think the, uh, the results uh, presented by T are really all tremendous and important. Um, we always uh, have this problem of uh, assessing the effect, but uh, I think it, it shows that uh, what one would uh, feel happened um, if you go back in history like question is, do you see the same effect also, I, I wasn't quite sure what I fully understood, do you see the same effect also in third states who benefit from MFN protection, or haven't you looked at the figures of the third state? You know, I'm, I'm asking because um, coming from Switzerland, uh, we were highly interested in um, the TTIP negotiations because we would benefit harmonizing standards and have to define IPs. And the second question is, what does that mean for IP policies of the West vis-a-vis -vis China? Because mm. that's the effect of these agreements. Are you really sure in this war we're engaged on technological edge that pushing for higher standards is the best way? Graham. I think the question also to Obama. Um, I suppose you could say, you know, evaluate. 
knows every country has asked us to do this, uh, to do this uh, because the one country does it, then they can get a bit of punishment, you might say. But if everyone's doing it, maybe it can be a good thing. Justin? Right. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to abuse my role as chair and ask two questions, actually. So actually, one is an observation, one is a question. Um, I was very intrigued, actually, by your finding on trademarks. And I was very intrigued by Josh's presentation on the role of standard-setting organizations in terms of you know, clearing patent tickets or trying to help deal with the problem. A thought that came to mind working a lot on trying to measure the impact of IP on economic development in, in different kinds of countries is that one of the key issues that policymakers usually struggle with is to try and set the scope, um, extent of patent protection, and really when should actually, what should be the standard. And maybe there is scope to combine the two kinds of results and look at standard setting organizations and how they could actually help countries use IP as needed for their level of development. A question for you, Keith, was I was very uh, interested by your finding that when you have these kinds of agreements, you see a drop in low IP exports. So my question was, does that have something to do with your sample? Do all countries see a drop in low IP exports because then IP helps them to specialize into medium or high tech? How do you explain that? Let me start with that one and I'll address Thomas's. Um, so to, to put those coefficients back into context, they're relative to countries that aren't in such agreements. So it doesn't mean a reduction necessarily. It might mean that. It means a decline relative to what other countries are doing. But it does mean, in that context, a reallocation of trade resources out of the low IP sectors somewhere, which ultimately becomes resources for exports to the high IP sectors. And so I don't, I mean, I haven't seen that kind of a sorting effect from these behind the border regulations going on anywhere else in these kinds of studies. So I appreciate that you think it's uh, potentially important. I hope so too. Uh, but that, I think, is how you would think about it. Now, these are average coefficients across a lot of countries. So I, I wouldn't infer from that that a particular country is observing this. But, uh, but nevertheless, um, it, the average is big enough to be significant and, and consistently significant. So it is uh, of some interest. Um, I, I, I think it would be interesting to take that low IP group because there's plenty of right. observations in this data sample and break that into yeah. things like commodities versus textiles right. and see what actually is happening. Uh, so um, chances are a referee will ask us to do that and I could report back to you later on. Um, so uh, Thomas, on, on third countries and whether they're getting these same kind of trade benefits if they're not a member is a really interesting question. The only evidence that's here on, that's relevant for that question is if you look at the import equations, because those imports are coming from non-member countries. So it's a reflection of what exports are increasing from those countries to these uh, IP partner countries. And there, the evidence is, is less systematic. It, varies, uh, but, but yeah, there is some evidence that, uh, that there's more imports of some of these higher tech products coming into the middle income and lower income countries, actually, uh, as a result of the middle income, lower income countries joining those. So, you know, in terms of the high tech trade versus the low tech trade, there's, there's a real sorting that sort of goes against comparative advantage for these poor countries, which is really pretty amazing, actually. Um, but I don't think you would look at these and conclude that Switzerland, which by the way is, is a treatment country here, not a control country, because they're part of the European area there. But, but um, I, don't, I don't think you would conclude that they are, they, they're ending up with a lot more exports into the United States as a result of, of these things. Um, the other question is about China, and it's I think a little bit broader than that. So I've actually argued a number of times uh, to policymakers in the US and in Brussels that 
if you take this kind of literature seriously, and I think Carson might agree with this, I'm curious what you think, Carson. This whole literature is, is finding most of the time that if there's any role of global intellectual property protection, it's to facilitate channels of technology transfer through multinationals and through formal markets of trade and so on. We don't know how much that's diminishing imitation. We don't know how much that's reducing reverse engineering. All of those things are questionable or interesting. But, we, but, but in terms of formal technology transfer, there's a pretty elastic response, uh, particularly to countries like China. And so if it's the case that this trade war, I mean, I'm very doubtful, but if it's the case that it gets the Chinese to, to sort of generate uh, um, the kind of modern, non-discriminatory, compensation-based technology transfer regime that we want them, or the, you know, the American administration wants them to have, then that'll generate uh, outward technology transfer in the United States of products and technologies that will actually replace higher income jobs in the United States, not lower income jobs, because it'll be the higher technology, middle to higher technology products that go. I don't think people quite recognize that. I've been saying this for a long time, but, you know, but I think it, it's going to have that impact, and it's, it's worth knowing. But that's the kind of question you're asking me, I think? Okay, yeah. I see a couple of more hands, and I actually would like to give an opportunity to Bowen and Josh and and Carsten to respond. So, um, is that Pedro is the only question? Are there any other questions? I'd like to quickly take a last round of questions, and then I want to invite all the panelists to respond. Pedro. But again, I, I really try hard to not make welfare calculations or conclusions from this kind of analysis. International trade is not well-being. I mean, it's it's a measure of innovation and technology, but that's what kind of what it is. But but um, I think a reasonable interpretation of this is if, if, if a poor country joins one of these agreements, and I have to say there aren't that many low-income countries that are in that group. So put, take that with a little bit of a grain. But even the lower middle-income countries, if they join these kinds of agreements, then that, according to these results, will make it more difficult for them to export the kinds of low-tech products in which they have uh, compared advantage in comparison with countries that don't join such agreements. So that sort of trade substitution effect of that is, take your favorite country. If Vietnam had an agreement with the United States, uh, Vietnam would see its exports of those kinds of products diminish relative to Malaysian exports of those kinds of products, which is... I think really interesting. I haven't seen that before. Uh, think of that as losing or not. Um, I'd like to invite all the other panelists to respond, please. All right. So I'm just going to pick up on your question around the extent to which standardization can be used as a tool for national advantage. And certainly one thing that's well worth emphasizing is that um, there has been a sort of strong political overlay in terms of standardization, really going back um, well more well beyond a century, um, and it essentially has had two dimensions to it. One of which has been across countries, and the other of which has been within countries, with particularly often, you know, incumbent firms, often for instance large telecoms, trying to use the standardization process to forestall entry, but to think about your specific question, which is really on the international basis. I think what's most striking to me is how, while there's been an enormous amount of effort in this area, how relatively limited efficacy it has had in terms of being able to tilt a table in terms of, uh, in terms of national interest. So you know, within Europe, uh, there is the, probably, it's fair to say, the dominant uh, standardization body is something called the European Telecommunications okay. Standards Institute, you know, which is, you know, through a variety of mechanisms, 
try to favor local champions while maintaining the appearance of uh, impartial. And I think if we look at the um, fate of Nokia, Ericsson, French Telecom, you know, we can make we can make a long list here. And I think it's fair to say that those efforts have not been uh, terribly successful. Um, you know, we did a, ser a series of case studies on the um, what WAPI, which is I got to look it up. It's WLAN, which is basically the Chinese answer to 802.11, which is essentially the standard which governs how our computers and cell phones connect to Wi-Fi, which is something that I engage in around 20,000 times a day. Um, and the Chinese tried to create their own standard along these lines and you know, ran into a lot of interference both from the International Standards Organization, much of which was being orchestrated behind the scenes by the United States and others, as well as just um, you know, internal issues. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the this has not, this not been an area certainly economists have looked at a lot, but I think the anecdotal experience would suggest it's harder to do to mill the standard process or push the standard process to promote national and in, national interest than has been than has been really appreciated. I think in a way with 5G we're getting version two of this and we'll see whether it plays out in a different way or not. So it's a fascinating issue. Yeah, just uh, to answer the question about um, trademarks, and I should apologize, I think I tried to compress too much content into, um, you know, what uh, were only 12, uh, or you said 14 minutes of presentation. Um, the background is the following. So there's a longstanding literature, you know, that, um, you know, trying to ask uh, how do companies profit from innovation? How do they appropriate their investments from innovation? Um, you know, there have been many surveys, firm-level surveys conducted uh, in the United States, in Europe, and Japan that have essentially concluded that uh, it's only in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry that patents are really of, of, of primary importance in appropriating returns to innovation. And in other industries, other mechanisms are more important. You know, branding um, being the first one in the product cycle, um, you know, moving down rapidly the learning curve um, and so on. Um, and essentially what we find in Chile is that if you look at, you know, the set of manufacturing companies that innovate, uh, you know, patents don't seem to be, you know, a particularly important uh, vehicle for them to benefit uh, from um, product innovation, but they do heavily rely on trademarks. And, you know, that's entirely consistent in a sense with what we find for rich countries um, and, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, technology-intensive products like the iPhone, you know, which is full of uh, patents, it's also full of industrial design rights. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you ask the question, well, why do consumers choose that product over another product, you know, brand reputation, you know, does play an important uh, role. Um, now you ask yourself, uh, in the case of the iPhone, you know, they sort of incrementally innovate, uh, but, you know, the price has increased by more than just incremental price increases. And again, that has a lot to do with the consumer goodwill that relies on the brand reputation. And so this link between brand reputation and innovation, you know, that's quite established in the literature. You know, it's something that, in a sense, we we uh, we find in Chile as well. I don't think it's such a revolutionary finding. And you know, just looking at patterns of trademark use in middle-income countries, we see, you know, that uh, trademarks are the form of intellectual property most heavily used uh, in developing economies. But it's sort of nice, at least, you know, to have that link established on the basis of firm-level data you know, that specifically looks at, um, you know, the innovative behavior of companies. I'd leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Dustin. Bhavan, do you want to add something to that? Um, sure. Maybe I'll answer the question about the, the experiment of 3D if, if other countries had it. I think it's, it's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, and it's a hard question precisely actually because of something Jerry has noted, um, uh, comparing it to a strict non-obviousness standard. And I've heard other legal scholars 
uh, also, you know, I don't think any in this room also say that, you know, in some ways it's similar to uh, certain interpretations of a, of a strong inventive step or non-obviousness standard. Um, that's sort of above my pay grade since I'm an economist, but uh, I can give you two empirical points. One, qualitatively, um, I mean, if you look, in, say, say both qualitatively and quantitatively, if you look empirically in India, almost all the time where there's a 3D rejection, there's also a non-obviousness rejection in the same sort of off office action. And we've interviewed, uh, Ken, Ken Chadl and I have interviewed uh, Indian patent examiners and said, like, why such fuss, fuss about 3D if you're also rejecting the same stuff on non-obviousness? And you get two kinds of answers. One is that there's a fringe of, there's a fringe of cases, um, some formulations and things like that, where 3D does some work or has some force above and beyond non-obviousness. But that would suggest that, you know, the, the, the numbers, the, the effect would be small. The other is kind of more kind of conceptual, and I, you know, I don't know how to test it. It's that 3D forces you to look at the application in a new way and kind of gives more force to non-obviousness. It's kind of interesting. So uh, that's one, one point. The second, though, is, you know, with some of my work with Scott Hempel on paragraph four patent challenges in the U.S., I mean, the same, many of the same things that are being knocked out by 3D plus inventive step in India are being knocked out by paragraph four patent challenges and non-obviousness in the U.S., including the secondary patent that was invalidated uh, uh, on Gleevec in India. So uh, my sense is actually it's, it's going to be small, but um, um, I could be wrong. Yeah. Thank you. So um, there are no more questions, and we are five minutes to the end of the session. So I am just going to. Oh, Jerry has a question. So. That's absolutely right. Though again, it's not going to matter much for primary patents, you know, um, and, that, and that's why I think you'll start to see thinking about, for better or worse, about compulsory licensing and price control systems. Thank you, thank you, everyone. I want to just close with one very pertinent <coughs> personal observation, which is that this report that Pedro commissioned and was authored by Jerry uh, and uh, some of the colleagues, Keith and Carlos Correa, who's not here, on. Uh, the TRIPS Agreement in Developing Countries is one of the most significant reports on the topic from UNCTAD, I believe, and I think I have earned the right to say this as, as having worked there for, for many years. So you know, with that note of appreciation for Jerry's work, I would like to close this session. I thank very much my eminent panelists, so thank you very much, and thank you all. Thank you.